According as circumstances are favorable, one should modify one's plans. Good day, everyone. Today on Literature, I will begin my reading of perhaps the epitome of a true classic of any leader, the aspiring apprentice or the accomplished ace alike. Sun Tzu's The Art of War. I and indeed, The Art of War, mine being Lionel Giles' translation in particular, has long been a literary companion fit for not just the warriors of its time, but those happy to invest themselves into a character of a strong and cunning business executive, or polemicist, or even a military mind of the modern era, and well beyond just these archetypes. The lessons in strategic thought, careful consideration, action and reaction to an evolving situation and gathering of information are each and every essential wisdoms of anyone that would seek to attain influence, power, wealth, or even solid relationships with others, professional or personal. But, without further ado, I'll let the text speak for itself. We begin with the introduction. Sun Tzu's The Art of War was virtually unknown in Europe until 1782, when a French Jesuit priest living in China, Joseph Emil, acquired a copy and translated it into French. It was not a great translation, because Dr. Giles wrote, It contains a great deal that Sun Tzu did not write, and very little indeed of what he did. Captain E. F. Calthrop RFA published the first English translation in 1905 in Tokyo. Dr. Guile said the translation was excessively bad. And it is not merely a question of downright blunders from which none can hope to be wholly exempt. Omissions were frequent. Heart passages were willfully distorted or slurred over. Such offenses are less pardonable. They would not be tolerated in any edition of a Latin or Greek classic and a similar standard of honesty ought to be insisted upon in translations from Chinese. In 1908, a new edition of Captain Calthrop's translation was published in London. It was an improvement. Omissions filled up and numerous mistakes corrected, but new errors were created in the process. Dr. Giles wrote about his own translation. It was not undertaken out of any inflated estimate of my own powers but I could not help feeling that Sun Tzu deserved a better fate than had befallen him, and I knew that, at any rate, I could hardly fail to improve on the work of my predecessors. Dr. Giles was a leading sinologist and an assistant to the Department of Oriental Printed Books and Manuscripts in the British Museum. Introduction Sun Wu and His Book Su Ma Qian gives the following biography of Sun Tzu. 1. Sun Tzu Wu was a native of Qi State. His art of war brought him to notice Ho Lu. 2. King of Wu. Ho Lu said to him, I have carefully perused your thirteen chapters. May I submit your theory of managing soldiers to a slight test? Sun Tzu replied, You may. Ho Lu asked, May the test be applied to women? The answer was again in the affirmative so arrangements were made to bring 180 ladies out of the palace. Sun Tzu divided them into two companies and placed one of the king's favorite concubines at the head of each. He then bade them all take spears in their hands and address them thus. I presume you know the difference between front and back, right and left hand. The girls replied, yes. Sun Tzu went on, when I say eyes front, you must look straight ahead. When I say left turn, you must face towards your left hand. When I say right turn, you must face towards your right hand. When I say about turn, you must face right around towards your back. Again the girls assented. The words of command having been thus explained, he set up the halberds and battle axes in order to begin the drill. Then to the sound of drums, he gave the order, right turn. But the girls only burst out laughing. Sun Tzu said, if words of command are not clear and distinct, if orders are not thoroughly understood, then the general is to blame. So he started drilling them again, and this time gave the order, left turn, whereupon the girls once more burst into fits of laughter. Sun Tzu 
If words of command are not clear and distinct, if orders are not thoroughly understood, the general is to blame. But if his orders are clear, and the soldiers nevertheless disobey, then it is the fault of their officers. So saying, he ordered the leaders of the two companies to be beheaded. Now the king of Wu was watching the scene from the top of a raised pavilion, and when he saw that his favorite concubines were about to be executed, he was greatly alarmed and hurriedly sent down the following message. We are now quite satisfied as to our general's ability to handle troops. If we are bereft of these two concubines, our meat and drink will lose their savor. It is our wish that they shall not be beheaded. Sun Tzu replied, Having once received His Majesty's commission to be the general of his forces, there are certain commands of His Majesty which, acting in that capacity, I am unable to accept. Accordingly, he had the two leaders beheaded and straightway installed the next pair in order as leaders in their place. When this had been done, the drum was sounded for the drill once more, and the girls went through all the evolutions, turning to the right or to the left, marching ahead or wheeling back, kneeling or standing, with perfect accuracy and precision, not venturing to utter a sound. Then Sun Tzu sent a messenger to the king, saying, Your soldiers, sire, are now properly drilled and disciplined, and ready for your majesty's inspection. They can be put to any use that their sovereign may desire. Bid them go through fire and water, and they will not disobey. But the king replied, Let our general cease drilling and return to camp. As for us, we have no wish to come down and inspect the troops. Thereupon Sun Tzu said, The king is only fond of words, and cannot translate them into deeds. After that, Holu saw that Sun Tzu was one who knew how to handle an army, and finally appointed him general. In the west, he defeated the Chu state and forced his way into Ying, the capital. To the north, he put fear into the states of Qi and Qin, and spread his fame abroad amongst the feudal princes, and Sun Tzu shared in the might of the king. About Sun Tzu himself, this is all that Su Ma Qian has to tell us in this chapter but he proceeds to give a biography of his descendant, Sun Pin, born about a hundred years after his famous ancestor's death, and also the outstanding military genius of his time. The historian speaks of him too as Sun Tzu, and in his preface we read, Sun Tzu had his feet cut off and yet continued to discuss the art of war. 3. It seems likely, then, that Pin was a nickname bestowed on him after his mutilation, unless the story was invented in order to account for the name. The crowning incident of his career, the crushing defeat of his treacherous rival Peng Chuan, will be found briefly related in Chapter 5. SS 19. Note. To return to the elder Sun Tzu, he is mentioned in two other passages of Shi Qi. In the second year of his reign, 512 BC, Ho Lu, king of Wu, took the field with Su Su, Ide, Yu Wan, and Po Pie, and attacked Chu. He captured the town of Shu and slew the two princes' sons, who had formerly been generals of Wu. He was then meditating a descent on Ying, the capital. But the general Sun Wu said, The army is exhausted. It is not yet possible. We must wait. After further successful fighting, in the ninth year, 506 BC, King Ho Lu addressed Wu Su Zhu and Sun Wu, saying, Formerly, you declared that it was not yet possible for us to enter Ying. Is the time ripe now? The two men replied, Chu's general, Su Chang, for, is grasping and covetous, and the princes of Tang and Xiai both have a grudge against him. If your majesty has resolved to make a grand attack, you must win over Tang and Sai, and then you may succeed. Ho Lu followed this advice, beat Chu in five pitched battles, and marched into Ying. 5. This is the latest date at which anything is recorded of Sun Tzu. He does not appear to have survived his patron, who died from the effects of a wound in 496. In another chapter, there occurs this passage. 6. From this time onward, a number of famous soldiers arose, one after the other. Kalfan, 7, who was employed by the Qin state, 
Wang Zhu ate in the service of Qi, and Sun Wu in the service of Wu. These men developed and threw light upon the principles of war. It is obvious enough that Su Ma Qian at least had no doubt about the reality of Sun Wu as a historical personage, and with one exception to be noted presently, he is by far the most important authority on the period in question. It will not be necessary, therefore, to say much of such a work as the Wu Yue Chun Qi, which is supposed to have been written by Chao Ye of the 1st century AD. The attribution is somewhat doubtful, but even if it were otherwise, his account would be of little value, based as it is on the Shi Qi and expanded with romantic details. The story of Sun Tzu will be found for what it is worth in Chapter 2. The only new points in it worth noting are 1. Sun Tzu was first recommended to Hulu by Wu Su Su. 2. He is called a native of Wu. 3. He had previously lived a retired life, and his contemporaries were unaware of his ability. The following passage occurs in Huainan Tzu. When sovereign and ministers show perversity of mind, it is impossible even for a Sun Tzu to encounter the foe. Assuming that this work is genuine, and hitherto no doubt has been cast upon it, we have here the earliest direct reference for Sun Tzu, for Huai Nan Tzu died in 122 BC, many years before the Shi Qi was given to the world. Liu Xiang, 80 through 9 BC, says the reason that Sun Tzu at the head of 30,000 men beat Chu with 200,000 is that the latter were undisciplined. Tin Ming Shi informs us that the surname Sun was bestowed on Sun Wu's grandfather by Duke Qing of Qi, 547 through 490 BC. Sun Wu's father, Sun Ping, rose to be a minister of state in Qi, and Sun Wu himself, whose style was Cheng Qing, fled to Wu on account of the rebellion, which was being fomented by the kindred of Tian Pao. He had three sons, of whom the second, named Ming, was the father of Sun Pen. According to this account, then, Pen was the grandson of Wu, which, considering that Sun Pen's victory over Wei was gained in 341 BC, may be dismissed as chronologically impossible. Whence these data were obtained by Tin Ming Shi, I do not know, but of course, no reliance whatever can be placed in them. An interesting document which has survived from the close of the Han period is the short preface written by the great Cao Cao, or Wei Wu Ti, for this edition of Sun Tzu. I shall give it in full. I have heard that the ancients used bows and arrows to their advantage. Ten. The Shu Chu mentions the army, among the eight objects of government. The I Ching says army indicates firmness and justice. The experienced leader will have good fortune. The Shi Ching says the king rose majestic in his wrath, and he marshaled his troops. The Yellow Emperor, Tang the Completer, and Wu Wang all used spears and battle axes in order to secure their generation. The Su Ma Fa says, If one man lay slain another of set purpose, he himself may rightfully be slain. He who relies solely on warlike measures shall be exterminated. He who relies solely on peaceful measures shall perish. Instances of this are Fu Chai, 11, on the one hand, and Yin Wang on the other, 12. In military matters, the sage's rule is normally to keep the peace, and to move his forces only when occasion requires. He will not use armed force unless driven to it by necessity. Many books have I read on the subject of war and fighting, but the work composed by Sun Wu is the profoundest of them all. Sun Wu was a native of the Qi state. His personal name was Wu. He wrote The Art of War in 13 chapters for Ho Lu, King of Wu. Its principles were tested on women, and he was subsequently made a general. He led an army westwards, crushed the Chu state, and entered Ying, the capital. In the north, he kept Qi and Qin in awe. A hundred years and more after his time, Sun Pin lived. He was a descendant of Wu. 13. 
In his treatment of deliberation and planning, the importance of rapidity in taking the field, 14. Clearness of conception and depth of design, Sun Tzu stands beyond the reach of carping criticism. My contemporaries, however, have failed to grasp the full meaning of his instructions, and while putting into practice the smaller details in which his work abounds, they have overlooked its essential purport. That is the motive which has led me to outline a rough explanation of the whole. One thing to be noticed in the above is the explicit statement that the thirteen chapters were specially composed for King Ho Lu. This is supported by the internal evidence of ISS 15, in which it seems clear that some ruler is addressed. In the bibliographic section of Han Shu, there is an entry which has given rise to much discussion. The works of Sun Tzu of Wu in 82 Pien are chapters, with diagrams in 9 Chuan. It is evident that this cannot be merely the 13 chapters known to Su Ma Qian or those we possess today. Cheng Xiaoqie refers to an edition of Sun Tzu's Art of War, of which the 13 chapters form the first Chuan, adding that there were two other Chuan besides. This has brought forth a theory that the bulk of these 82 chapters consisted of other writings of Sun Tzu. We should call them apocryphal, similar to the Wind Ta, of which a specimen dealing with the nine situations, 15, is preserved in the Tung Tian, and then another in Ho Xin's commentary. It is suggested that before his interview with Ho Lu, Sun Tzu had only written the 13 chapters but afterwards composed a sort of exegesis in the form of question and answer between himself and the king. Pai Li Sun, the author of the Sun Tzu Su Lu, backs this up with a quotation from the Wu Hu Chan Chi, the king of Wu summoned Sun Tzu, and asked him questions about the art of war. Each time he set forth a chapter of his works, the king could not find words enough to praise him. As he points out, if the whole work was expounded on the same scale as in the above-mentioned fragments, the total number of chapters could not fail to be considerable. Then the numerous other treatises attributed to Sun Tzu might be included. The fact that the Han Chi mentions no work of Sun Tzu except the 82 Pien, whereas the Su and Tang bibliographies give the titles of others in addition to the 13 chapters, is good proof, Pai Li Xion thinks, that all of these were contained in the 82 Pien. Without pinning our faith to the accuracy of details supplied by the Yue Chun Chi, or admitting the genuineness of any of the treatises cited by Pai Li Xun, we may see in this theory a probable solution of the mystery. Between Su Ma Qian and Pan Qiu, there was plenty of time for a luxuriant crop of forgeries to have grown up under the magic name of Sun Tzu and the 82 Pien may very well represent a collected edition of these lumped together with the original work. It is also possible, though less likely, that some of them existed at the time of the earlier historian and were purposely ignored by him. 16. Tu Mu's conjecture seems to be based on a passage which states, Wei Wu Ti strung together Sun Wu's Art of War which in turn may have resulted from a misunderstanding of the final words of Cao King's preface. This, as Sun Sing Yen points out, is only a modest way of saying that he made an explanatory paraphrase, or in other words, wrote a commentary on it. On the whole, this theory has met with very little acceptance. Thus, the Su Qiu Chuan Chu says, the mention of the thirteen chapters of the Shi Shi show that they were in existence before the Han Qi, and that letter accretions are not to be considered part of the original work. Tu Mu's assertion can certainly not be taken as proof. There is every reason to suppose, then, that the thirteen chapters existed in the time of Su Ma Qian, practically as we have seen them now. That the work was well known, he tells us in so many words. Sun Tzu's thirteen chapters and Wu Qi's Art of War are the two books that people commonly refer to on the subject of military matters. Both of them are widely distributed, so I will not discuss them here. But, as we go further back, serious difficulties begin to arise. The salient fact which has to be faced is that So Chuan, the greatest contemporary record, 
makes no mention whatsoever of Sun Wu, either as a general or as a writer. Thank you all for listening. Whether you found my content enjoyable or detestable, please give a thumbs up or down, share the video with others, subscribe and contribute to the discussion via my Twitter or Minds.com channel, join the community at our Discord server through the invite link below, and engage with your fellow watcher via the comments below that. If you'd like to support the Zilver with a Z channel and allow me to take on idiocy and reach out to friends and fans on social media and keep the channel going and get rewarded for it, I would ask you to donate monthly via Patreon. You can do this by following the link to my Patreon and becoming my patron, or if you wish to donate only once, a PayPal tip jar is listed above that in the description. Till then, everyone, this has been Zilver with a Z. Thank you.